All right. So talk about questionnaires that come through today, um, often called due diligence surveys, the security questionnaires, all kinds of different things. Um, and we're going to be talking about kind of why, why, why they exist, what, what people are looking for. A couple of things you can try um, about um, due diligence questionnaires um, for, for smaller companies. Um, and also um, one uh, brutal truth about due diligence questionnaires as well. So um, really, when, when a uh, partner sends uh, a due diligence questionnaire, um, they're, they're looking for something. There's, there's something they want to know. Um, obviously, they're they're looking at your security posture, your due diligence, your, your um, data protection posture, that kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, you can boil down what they're looking for into into one simple phrase. Um, they're looking to see that you've got your shit together. Um, let's let's put it bluntly. Um, this is it. This is what they're they're looking to see. Quite quite often, they'll ask for lots of different policies and procedures and things like that. Um, but ultimately, what they're trying to establish is that you you know what you're doing. You've got things in the right place and. There's two reasons for that. One, some companies do genuinely care about due diligence and they do um, take it very seriously and they have an in-house DPO or, or some someone like me who, who reads through all the answers and, and, and actually takes a lot of care in them. Um, but other times it's about protecting themselves as well. They might have contractual requirements with other people that say they have to do due diligence questionnaires on any potential new partners. Um, they have their, their their reasons and motivations. And so sometimes it's just a case of protecting themselves and they're not necessarily going to be deep diving into every single thing that you send. You don't know that when you when you get these and it, it's it's often not worth taking the risk. Um, but that's one of the the realities of these um of these surveys um so they they're effectively if they're taking that risk based approach they they they're thinking about the risks involved in working with your company so they want to see certain things that they can say right well that limits and and, and mitigates the the risk those are things like data protection and information security is a priority for the business that's a real key one and for obvious reasons they don't want it to be just kind of something that's done um just as a tick box exercise or something that, that that isn't really in place, they want to be able to see that this is a, a priority for the business. They're going to take it seriously. You've got the legal minimum in place. This is really important because that's you have to. <laughs> Simply as that, you have to have the, the legal minimums in place. So they're going to want to see those things. Um, you can be trusted with their data. That's another thing that obviously they're they're very interested in because again, when you're looking at it from that liability perspective or um, being able to demonstrate that they've, they've done the right things. Um, that you can be trusted with their data is, is super important there. Um, additionally, they want to know what to do, that, that, that you know what to do when you have a breach. Um, if they're giving you their, their data, um, this is a really important one for obvious reasons. If something goes wrong, you've got things in place and you've got um, the ability to respond effectively to breaches and incidents let them know about it, have all the right things in place um, when it comes to those those things. And finally, that you understand what you have. So uh, one of the key things is you answer the questions correctly. Um, you understand what these things are, what they mean, and, and why you have them. That's that's an important aspect of it as well. Um, so making sure that, that that you understand what you have. Again, it's not just a tick box exercise um, that when they ask for an information asset register, you know what that is and you know why. You know what the, what the purpose of that or a supplier security policy again that you know what that is and you know the purpose of that um that's a really important one when, when judging responses to a due diligence questionnaire so one of the questions we get asked a lot is for, for uh, particularly on the smaller end is what what should i have in place and like i said we're looking at kind of establishing that you've got your your shit together so at the minimum you should at least have the basics in place to pass due diligence and like I said before, this is all the legally required stuff. And I'm just going to go into a little bit about what, what this means. These are things that are required by law. So if we take the UK, for example, or the or the EU, which is effectively still pretty much the same, those are things like records of processing activities. That's a document required under Article 30 of the GDPR. It's not, it's not a negotiable thing. It's a legally required document for pretty much every company um, in, in the UK and the EU. That's something that you have to have in place. Retention schedules, understanding how long you retain data and all of, all of those sorts of things. Again, the GDPR says you can only keep um, data for as long as you need it. Um, and certain laws in place, like in the UK, you've got the Limitation Act of 1980, tells you you have to keep contracts for six years and no longer. Um, those are kind of things that they want to be able to see that are in place um, because, again, that's a, a legal requirement. 
And then there are things like DPIAs, LIAs, what those are, are kind of risk assessments based on certain types of processing that you do. If you fall into the category of needing to do DPIAs and LIAs, you'll want to be able to demonstrate that you have them. But also quite a lot of organizations, particularly if you do any kind of risky processing, will ask to see your DPIA. They'll ask to see your data protection impact assessment. And effectively what a, what a DPIA is, is a risk assessment of, um, of processing data. Um, so quite often companies will ask to see that, um, see a version of that. Um, so you want to think about having something like that in place. And also having a decent privacy notice. I mean, the first place they're going to look is your website. So having a decent privacy notice is a really good place to start um, because, again, it's publicly facing. It's available online. It's one of the first places that they're going to look and, and see these things. Um, so that's that's really key. Tom, what's, yes. what's a decent privacy notice? The underline decent. Good question. We could do a we could do a a, yeah, a, a session on, on that. I, I'd say, but um, it's not copied and pasted. It's not full of legalese and and just clearly downloaded template online. Um, a decent privacy notice is one that actually tells people what you're doing with their personal data in a way that pretty much anyone can understand. Um, it's it's not got loads of waffle. It's not got loads of legal terms. You know, it's not got it's not opaque and difficult to read. It's not 17 pages long be really short and snappy tells you exactly what you need to know um and you, you know people say well why why does this matter well because it shows you put some effort into it so when i when i'm looking so i've been on the other side of due diligence, i've been on both sides of due diligence in my in my time when when you when you view these kind of um privacy notices that are clearly downloaded copied and pasted on the internet it doesn't give you a good impression it, it gives you the impression that this, this company doesn't really care about these things they've just copied and pasted it they've 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 not prioritized this in any sense of the word. They've, they've copied and pasted someone else's. And a classic example of that is the uh, the, the British government who got the ferries um, as a result of Brexit and copied and pasted the privacy notice from a takeaway. Um, that made the news a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just poor, isn't it? It's just bad practice. And so it doesn't give a very good impression and would certainly make me... Um, question some of the responses and some of it because if, if your privacy notice is just copied and pasted well how do i know that your policies are not just downloaded from the internet as well and you don't actually mean them you, you've got no evidence of being able to demonstrate that you have them so it just gives a bad first impression so whatever you put online whatever you put publicly make sure it gives a good impression i would say because that that's the the first place you're going to look and first impressions count definitely need a breach incident procedure um and like I said, this is absolutely key because this is a huge risk, particularly nowadays. Lots of cyber attacks, lots of things, lots of things happening in that space. So being able to tr being able to trust that an organisation knows what to do if things go wrong is is so important. I mean, this is this is almost non negotiable. Um, you want you want to be able to demonstrate that you've got you've you've got this in place and you'd know what to do if things went wrong. So hundred percent is something along these lines. And also, as I said. How do you demonstrate that strategic awareness of, of data protection? Now, I spoke about that this is important and having this as a priority, but how do you demonstrate this? Well, things things that demonstrate this are stuff like uh, internal audits. And again, internal audits, they don't have to be super in-depth. We're not talking like KPMG-style internal audits. This is just kind of a sense check of what have we done? What are our gaps? What do we need to do going forward? What can we do? What can't we do? All of those sorts of things. So... It's going to be really simple, but it demonstrates that you're paying attention to what's happening and you're focusing on progress and improvement and those, those sorts of things. Also, things like accountability frameworks, like who's actually responsible for data protection? Are these roles that you've taken seriously? You've thought about making the right people responsible for the right things. You know, you've got potentially something like a data champion network. It just demonstrates that as a business, you take this seriously. This is something that business-wide is taken seriously. And also, if you have senior discussions about this, document it. It's such useful proof that this is a this is a um, a, a priority for the business, and, they, and and at a senior level. So you've got two tick boxes there ticked straight away. Um, so really important to be able to document those sorts of things. So there's that's an example of some of the basics that you would absolutely want to have in place. I mean, there's a lot more that we could go into, and there's a lot more detail. And I'm, I'm going to save that more for the for the Q and A and and any questions that we get, Mitch, and we can dive into some of that as well. Um, but I think it's just worth noting that even with the basics um there are some things to to remember um some contracts absolutely require verified certifications such as iso 27001 cyber essentials plus an example of that is the uk government will always require cyber essentials for any contract with them that's a that's an that's an absolute um absolute kind of 
non-negotiable for working with the government, for example, or the NHS or something like that. Um, and again, ISO 27001 is a big one from a security perspective. If you yourself are certified to ISO 27001 standard, you have a responsibility to make sure that your supply chain is secure. One of the ways of making sure that's the case is insisting that your supply chain also has ISO 27001. It's the simplest and easiest way to demonstrate that kind of secure supply chain so you will find that you will find that some companies have really onerous requirements and they have their reasons for it it's worth remembering they're not doing this just for the fun of it trust me it's not very fun even on the other side so um this is not something that's being done for the fun of it and again the above stuff that we've spoken about it's the basics only it doesn't guarantee you're going to pass you're ultimately always going to have to be working to improve your condition and Look, it's always worth having a conversation. Try and speak to someone. If, if, you, if you've got a big questionnaire that you, you're struggling to answer, you don't have the answers to it, try and try and get on the phone to that person who sent it to you or that company that sent it to you and have a, have a chat about it. They're humans. They're people. There are some things that you can negotiate. Because now we're coming to the brutal truth about some of these surveys, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. Some companies don't even read your answers. Sometimes. Like I said, some companies are trying to cover their own backs. Um, I know of a, um, a CISO, a chief information security officer, um, one time had a massive due diligence survey from a company, thought to himself, he tried to get in contact with the company and they said, no, 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 just, just, fill, in the, um, just fill in the questionnaire. And he filled it in with song, song lyrics and uh, they passed the due diligence. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's a brutal reality to this that sometimes these things are not read. Um, and so you can put in all of these things in place, make sure that you are putting a decent amount of effort into these things. But the reality is you're not always going to be able to talk to the company because sometimes they're just doing this to cover their own back. They're not going to really be engaging with you on these sorts of things. Um, so brutal reality of, of some of these things is, yeah, look, let's be honest, some companies... Not many, but some companies, they don't even bother to read your answers. So um, there are definitely um, scenarios where trying to find out from them, you know, what if I had this in place or what if I was working towards this or anything has no impact, it has no effect, um, and you should just fill it in anyway and, and see what happens. But my my top advice is that put in, the, put in the maximum effort you can into these things, put in those basics in place if you don't have them already, work to continuously improve your position and start building up a bank of responses. A lot of these, a lot of these responses are very similar. Um, you know, lots of organizations ask very similar things. So start building up a bank of, of responses as well um, because that's going to help you respond to these in future. Um, I think that's everything on this side of things because I didn't want to take up too much time i got kind of kept it to 20 minutes on the kind of presentation side of things um so you're not just listening to me talk for the entire time and about about or talk at you rather than to you that's that's let's say um mitch you mentioned we had a couple of questions come in beforehand um also yeah. just to remind my own people on the chat if you've got any questions about due diligence or anything that you said stick it in the chat please um we'll answer them as they come up um so anything that you've got um, in there please put them in the chat but in the meantime um in case we, we don't have any questions from today or um people are still thinking about them um mitch do you want to do you want to yeah. um, sure you know? so first one is how do you manage vendor requests slash expectations that seem disproportionate to smaller companies yeah this is this is this is a classic one right i think yeah. There are multiple options, and it will really depend on the um, on the company themselves and the company that you're working with. Like I say, having the minimums in place is pretty much non-negotiable because most of these things are legally required. So there's 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 an element of you can't argue scale against the law. You can't say, "Well, I'm really small, so I can't comply with the law." It's not an argument. It doesn't work. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's like saying, well, I'm, I'm really small, so I can't afford an accountant, therefore I can't pay my taxes. It, it, it doesn't work. It, it's, not, it's not a valid argument. So you have to have the basics in place. They're non-negotiable. It's what the law says. If you don't have what the law says, you're not going to pass these things because you're not going to be taken seriously. So you've got the basics in place. Let's assume you do have the basics in place. And, and listen, the basics, there feels like a lot of things and people say, oh, that's, that in itself yeah. is disproportionate. It's not disproportionate because actually in reality, they don't take that 
much kind of um what's the best way to put this they they themselves can be proportionate to your business a records of processing activities from microsoft is going to be ridiculous there's, there's going to be loads of them it's going to be very complicated if you're someone who has one product pulling together a records of processing activity and maintaining it is not onerous it's going to take a little bit of effort but it's not so ridiculously onerous that you can't do it you have to do it and actually you can make these things proportionate there are lots of optional things we can add that might be useful so we could add this column here and this column there and that column there that might be useful but again looking at the bare minimum that you have to capture some of these things are just not onerous so um have those legal minimums in place and have those things that you absolutely need and then at that point there's like three routes one you try and have a conversation with them that's that's kind of the first thing that I would say. Try and have a conversation with them. Um, there might be uh, room to negotiate some things. We have absolutely worked with lots of um, these situations where we've had a conversation with them and uh, on behalf of our customers and they've agreed that, oh, as long as something is scheduled or as long as something's in the plan, yeah. oh, we, we'll only work with customers that have ISO 27001. Okay, this customer doesn't have ISO 27001, but they, they are working towards it in the next year or so. Okay, yeah, that's fine those things those things happen right so it's always worth having those conversations and speaking about that and thinking about what's scheduled what your gaps are and what kind of things you're you're working on over the next period of time um because that 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 can work the second option is like i said take a risk fill it in be honest hope they don't read it if they do read it you you, you you're just going to have to kind of it's 50 50 whether they accept you or not um that's the second option it's a slightly riskier option obviously um but it's on the table, um, but there's a chance you might be de 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 denied. The third option is the brutal truth. You might just not be mature enough to work with some of these huge companies. Mm. That that's that's an unfortunate truth. There is a there is a period as a as a startup as a scale up where you just might not be mature enough to work with the likes of Microsoft. They, they might they might just decline you because they have the power to do so. They don't necessarily need you. Um, in the same way that you need them. It's a disproportionate relationship and, and it's a brutal reality, but it's the truth. There might be a scenario where you just have to pause on kind of the, these big enterprise whilst you mature your position and then and then return to the field. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, that is, that is a reality. You know, there are some companies you work with who partner with the NHS. NHS is about 400 security questions in order to pass their due diligence. Some companies that that want to therefore work with the NHS are going to really struggle. They're going to really struggle at, if they're if they're a two person company that's just starting out. You know, it's going to be really it's going to be really tricky. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, there is a there is a brutal reality of it um, that you're not you're not guaranteed to pass. You're not guaranteed to have enterprise customers who are going to in, interact with you. But like I said, first thing to do understand what you have understand what you don't have and have a conversation if you can't have a conversation fill it in anyway if you keep getting rejected there is a chance that you need to mature your position first and then you can return to the enterprise field so that's my um there's my kind of three three steps nice that makes sense i definitely think there's value in getting on the phone with the people on the other side and talking through it particularly if you're worried that you don't comply with all of the questions a lot of the time if there's a conversation around it and you can tell them you're working towards things like ISO, yeah, please will bend around that. We we have done it. I was just I was just doing maths in my head. We have done that with over twenty percent of our customers actually. What's that again? We've got that, on the phone we've got that negotiation. Yeah. Um where we've spoken to them and, and they've said, Yeah, fine, as long as there's a plan or something something in, in place. We've I, I can think on off the top of my head at least just over twenty percent of our customers. And it, um, we have negotiated. Also, they're making sure the sales reps who are handling the engagement, assuming you're in B2B, don't look at it themselves as a tick box exercise and see it themselves as something that they need. That Like this is still part of the sale. And then bringing in an expert will always be very helpful as well. I think it brings a certain amount of weight with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, next one. How, how are you seeing the landscape changing with data questionnaires? Where do you see it going next? We've only got we've only got half an hour, so yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's yeah. It's not gonna get easier. Is my simple answer.
is the landscape going to change dramatically? I don't think so. Is it going to ease off and, and get less onerous? Absolutely not. Because the kind of threats and the legislation and the particularly the EU, right? It, it, when we talk about the UK, the UK are basically the the laid back version of data protection in Europe. You know, the the the, the UK version of GDPR is the equivalent of like sitting there with its feet up, cocktail in its hand, um, relaxing on the beach, compared to the EU. Those the the EU is particularly zealous about data protection, and and things in the EU are just getting court case after court case, uh, regulator decision after regulator decision are just getting stricter and more difficult. And you know, in my absolute personal view, um, they're getting a little bit silly about certain things yeah. um, because it's just being so strict that it's just unrealistic. Um, but that's their approach, right? So. The, the the legal side of things, the law side of things, is just getting harder to navigate. So it means that for companies, for big companies like Facebook, Microsoft, Google, that kind of thing, they're having to jump through more hoops. They're having to prove that, so they're having to make you jump through more hoops. So reality is that those those are the things that are happening on the legal side of things. And then on the practical security side of things, well, look, cyber attacks are not going down. They're going up. The amount of businesses being put out of business by cyber attacks are going up. So the, the 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 chance that the company is going to be less strict about its uh, the security of its partners is is just not not the case. You know the the, the complexity of threats that we're facing in the future are, are just going to c continuously increase and continuously get more complex, and therefore the defenses against them are going to have to be too. So yeah, I don't see it massively changing, massively like shifting sideways or anything, but I think absolutely it's going to get a bit stricter. Um, only thing I can I can see um, potentially changing in this space is that um, more and more companies we're seeing now are using like portals and stuff to get responses. So in the previous world, you'd get like Excel spreadsheets you have to fill in or something like that. We're seeing a lot more portals um, being brought into place um, with with the bigger customers where you have to log into their portal and fill in their questions. Um, they're harder <laughs> to get through because you can't amend, you can't add notes. You can, you know that they're, they're they're more they're more they're more stringent. They're more. Um, so we're seeing an increase in those as well. So I like to be the bearer of good news when it comes to data protection, and I like to try and simplify it and make things easier and 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 not make people scared about it because I think that it's a, a topic that's that you that anyone can get their head around and. Um, interact with and, and find find straightforward um in in the, when it's presented in the right way unfortunately the reality of this is like i can't be too um too uh, uh upbeat about the future of due diligence questionnaires i think they're going to get worse i think they're going to get stricter and harder nice okay cool um so our next question is uh, at what point do we really need iso 27001 which is, I feel like it's subjective. It depends on the business and the, the type of data you're handling, the type of companies you're yeah. about. What, yeah, what would you say? It's like no one needs it. It's 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 an optional security standard. No one no one ever needs ISO twenty seven thousand one. It's a it's a choice. And the choice that you 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 face on ISO twenty seven thousand one, I guess I'd break into a couple of things. One, you just want to mature your security posture. But ISO twenty seven thousand one is great for that. It's great for maturing a company. It's great for um, putting in place things that are what other big companies do. It's it's it, it's a it's a growing up period for the company for a lot of cases. You know, they, they have to they have to take things more seriously. They have to take um, information security more seriously. The way they develop their app has to be taken more seriously. All of those sorts of things. So I think definitely from a maturing perspective, when when there comes a time when you choose to mature your company and, and grow it. Another example is as you get bigger, um, you're more likely to hire people that come from backgrounds that have been certified with ISO 27001. So you'll get a kind of internal um, drive for some of these measures anyway. And then it's like, well, it makes sense to go for it. And then the other 
position where you uh, would want ISO 27001 is you, if you're getting pushback from potential partners or investors or things like that. Um, at that stage, again, it remains a choice because you can just pivot and do something else. But if you want to get into the market of enterprise and the market of um, bigger customers and the market of uh, public sector and things like that, it's a it's a really helpful boost um, to to get in, and, and in sometimes um, it can be a deal breaker not having it or not planning to get it. Um, so again, that's that's an option where you can choose to have it. Um, and I guess kind of the the the, the final um, the final time that you might choose to go for um, ISO twenty seven thousand one mm. was was just in my head as I was talking about the. Um, about the landscape um and it slipped if it comes back to me i will i will i will remind you but i think yeah key, key reasons are um you want to mature or you've got internal pressure to mature or you're facing contractual requirements in which to to get iso 27001 because that's a really key key one uh, i guess another one i can think of is you get to put a badge on your website as well you get to demonstrate to your customers that you've got it um so it's a it can be a positive um external reflection of, of the fact that you take these things seriously if, if trust is a big issue we work with one company that i, I won't disclose their, their their name or anything like that but they've chosen to go for iso 27001 because no one else in the industry has it so it's a real opportunity to, to stand out and in particularly in in the area of work that they that they do it's a real kind of marketing bonus and it's uh, rare to see information security as something to be marketed but today it is today it is something to shout about um, so yeah, for, for for them, they've chosen to get it because it, it allows them to differentiate themselves in the industry and market that they take these things seriously, and and that's a real big factor, I think. It's, it's worth noting as well that there's a significant amount of work that goes into it. So if you don't actually need it at every early stage, sometimes it's worth just sticking with the basics until you're perhaps maturing up a bit more. Yeah, it's it's externally audited, and and the audits are serious. They're not they're not easy um so yeah that you do it, it takes it takes it takes work it takes time and it takes maintenance um just because mm -hmm. you get the certification doesn't mean you keep the certification you're audited every year that you have the certification to check that you still deserve it so um it can be taken away from you as well so um yeah it's it's a, it's a significant undertaking and and yeah you're right there 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 for some companies is a is a time when potentially they they don't have the resources to be able to manage it um but also uh, another quick thing I would add to that, Mitch, is that it's easier to implement ISO in a 10-person company than a 10,000-person company. So um, also worth noting that the, the, the bigger you get, the more complex it will it will get to implement ISO. Um, so sometimes the sooner you can be working on these things, the better. But again, if you're starting off with that senior accountability, um, with that... Um, with, with putting the legal basics in place with a breach incident and, you, and you're driving these things and they become part of your culture, then hopefully what you will see is that when you then start to expand on that, it's actually not as difficult um, as if you were just starting completely from scratch. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, and last question I've got here is we need to train our staff on GDPR. Should we go for off-the-shelf training or custom training? <laughs> yeah, go for... Go for what works for you. I think um, it's a really tough question to to, to answer. Um, if you're going for off the shelf training, choose wisely. is my is my advice. Um, actually, whatever training you're going for, choose wisely. So much of it is so fucking boring. That, that let's be honest. You know, I used to have to sit through these in in previous places I've worked, and I would fall asleep. And it's my job, right? So. Um, even I don't find them interesting. So choose choose carefully um, because you want something that's engaging. You want something that's short and snappy, that gets to the point straight away, that that, that does the job quite quickly. Because otherwise you're you're presenting anything you do in data protection or, or security as boring, as onerous, as just like... There's a French term, babon, which means beard growing. You know, it's so boring. You know, you sit there and your 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 beard is growing. You're presenting it as that. You know, then that's just not what what we uh, what we want to get across with data protection, right? You want it to be seen as something that no, oh, actually, it's not that bad. Or actually, maybe it can be fun at times. Or actually, oh, it's quite interesting because that's how you're going to get the buy-in. So, so choose very carefully. 
Um, I think that goes for custom and and um, and and non-custom. I guess non-custom can do the job, and it does the job very well for most companies. Most companies don't have custom training. Like you, you don't you don't need custom training. Um, if you want custom training, you can get custom training. The the thing to bear in mind is that custom training is accurate at a point in time if your company changes or moves or anything you've got to redo the training so it's something that requires kind of continuous um kind of updating and, and maintenance in a way that off uh, you know outsourcing it to a a standard amount of videos doesn't um there's kind of off-the-shelf trainings they they update for you you don't need to be constantly doing that um but i mean we, yeah we, we we roll out um effectively customizable off-the-shelf training i think and that and that's probably the the the, the sweet spot and something that, that that we do which is it's it's off the shelf but you can customize what people see um from that huge list of, of options so if you're a company uh taking things off we added a load of stuff during the pandemic about working from home um to our to our training videos um because obviously a lot more people were working from home for obvious reasons um We've had companies that have gone back to the office and we've got companies that are continuing to work from home. If you're able to to pick the modules, you know, so the companies that are working from home, they're obviously picking the working from home modules and the companies working in the office are picking the office security modules. Um, that's the kind of sweet spot. Um, it has to be relevant, but it can be relevant even with off the shelf as long as you can customize what you're showing people. So there is a, there is a kind of middle ground to be found between the two, which is yes, it's off the shelf, but you customize the topics that you see. Um, and that, that to me is a sweet spot. And the reason I would say it's a sweet spot is because it is partially customizable. So you can make sure it's super relevant to your business, but you don't have to be constantly updating it yourself. Every time anything changes, you don't have to re-record the videos or, or you know, put put constant effort into constantly, um, you know, giving this to an L and D person who's constantly um, updating this. You've got someone doing it for you, so that's what I would say the kind of sweet spot is. But yeah, it's very hard to answer that question with do this or this. Um, hopefully, I've just covered kind of the pros and cons yeah. of, of of all of them. I think the other common area that we've seen people fall down on is that they look at their solution to making the business data compliant. If it, the solution is uh, some e-training on an ad hoc basis, when I feel like the e-training is only one component of the infrastructure you need to run a data compliant business. So e-training on its own may be quite ineffective. However, if you've got the right policies and procedures implemented in the business combined with e-training, then it will start to be much more effective. Yeah, you've got you to back it up. But people are not stupid. So if you if you make them sit through a two hour video about data protection and you've got nothing in place internally, they're not going to take it seriously. They're going to put it on while they do some other work. You know, they're, they're not going to care. So yeah, you have to back it up because because pe people are not silly. Um, so people will, people will work you out pretty quickly. Um, but also yeah, like like you say, Mitch, there is an element of also reinforcing yeah. um, the the training um, with the policies and procedures to back it up um, that that are going to make it all make sense. So yeah, definitely. I think it's the difference between ticking a box and actually reducing risk and making sure that the training forms part of a wider... Um, your biggest risk, 100%, your biggest risk, as sad as it is to say, is your stuff. Yeah, people. It's, they're the ones that are going to cause you a data breach. They're the ones that are going to click the phishing email that downloads the virus into your systems. They're the ones that are going to fall for the uh, email from the CEO asking them to buy gift cards on Google. It's your employees that are going to do that. Um, we all do it. It's, it's something that happens most of the time accidentally, sometimes even maliciously, but most of the time it's just accidental and cyber attacks and that and getting so much more sophisticated, um, but also like you know, everyone's caused a breach at some point. So staff training is, is, yeah. is absolutely key to reducing your, your absolute biggest risk. And yeah, I know that it's a good point, Mitch, because when we talk about training, internally we we actually categorize that as part of managing risk you know we, we we don't have training as its own separate thing we we categorize it as part of how do you manage risk effectively one of the ways you do that is training staff so yeah absolutely it's a it's a great risk mitigation and that's why it has, it's got to be good and engaging mm. it's just a tick box thing and it's boring and no one really pays attention to it you've not mitigated any risk and you've just spent a lot of money to not not achieve anything so 
And um, yeah, I feel like every, every business invests so heavily in like product and technical security really early on, but they fall down when it comes to actually people security or real life human security, which is where, which is where like you've just said, a lot of the risk lies from a breach or an incident perspective. Yeah, people forget about their employees all the time. We've covered this in other topics, you know, yeah. like people forget that their employees are covered by GDPR in the same way that everyone else is in terms of like they have the same rights and all that kind of stuff. But that also, like you say, people forget their employees are a risk and also like a natural tendency to just trust people. I think is really key. Like we 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 want we want to trust our colleagues and stuff like that. And so there's an element of of just kind of of just trusting people. And I think that's that's great. That's that's fine. But they're manager the is like ten employees, but once you're at fifty, a hundred and so forth, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Not feasible. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, that's all of the questions, unless there are any other questions anyone else would like to submit. I've got them just I've read out the questions of people who are on the call. So um, Yeah, I've not seen any come in via the chat. Um and potentially some of those questions that we answered were questions that the people here submitted. So um, hopefully we've answered answered those for you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, whilst we're wrapping up, I think you got a couple of minutes if you want to put in a question. Now's the time to do it. Otherwise, um, yeah, we're, we're going to wrap up. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you all enjoyed that, took something from the session. Um, and yeah, I think it's a great questions that, that came in. Um, it was interesting. Um, and yeah, thanks, Stefan. Um, Mitch, do you, do you want to do you want to wrap things up? Um, yeah, nothing else to add here. We've got all of our questions. Um, we will be getting into a regular cadence of events. Um, they will be set up every two weeks. Um, but I'll I'll keep you guys posted with a short reminder email before each event comes up. Um, so please do join future events and let us know if you've got any follow up questions. Yeah, and I guess one thing that's, that, that I would just add to that is if there's any topics that you guys want to see, you want us to cover, um, yes. reach out and let us know because we want these to be useful for you um, as much as anything. So, you know, if there's something on your mind that you're like, I wish I knew this or I wish I had someone who could cover this for me, um, let us know, you know, like I wish I knew how to comply with international laws or I wish I knew how to respond to social access requests. Please, please let us know um we're always always keen to get ideas from from people yeah this this event itself was an idea from um someone in an audience so um yeah please please do let us know good. cool Thank all right thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you at the next one um yeah thanks mitch for the, yes, for the questions no worries bye -bye. thanks everyone bye